Welcome back to Deep Learning. So today we want to talk about regularization techniques and we'll start with a short introduction to regularization and the general problems of overfitting. The pre-deep learning textbook that told you you need to have fewer parameters and you have data samples. You know, if you have a non-convex objective function, you have no guarantee of convergence. You know, all those things that you read in textbook and they tell you stay away from this and they're all wrong. So you can see here that we will first start about the background. What is the problem of regularization? Then we talk about classical techniques, normalization, dropout, initialization, transfer learning is a very common one. Transfer learning, and it has been done in principle for many decades. And multitask learning. So why are we talking about this topic so much? Well, if you want to fit your data, then Problems like these ones, they're easy to fit because they have a clear solution. But typically you have the problem that your data is noisy and you cannot easily separate them. So what you then run into is the problem of underfitting. If you have a model that doesn't have a very high capacity, then you may have something like this line here, which is not a very good fit to describe the separation of the classes. The contrary, is overfitting. So here we have models with very high capacity. Now these high capacity models try to model everything that they observe in the training data and this may yield decision boundaries that are not very reasonable. What we are actually interested in is a sensible boundary that is a, somehow a compromise between the observed data and the actual ground truth representation. So we can analyze this problem by the so-called bias variance decomposition and here we stick to regression where we have an ideal function h and this has some value and it's typically associated with some measurement noise so there's some additional value epsilon that is added to h of x and this then may be distributed uh, normally with a zero mean and a standard deviation of sigma epsilon. Now you can go ahead and uh, use a model to estimate h and this is now f hat that is estimated from some data set d and we can now express the loss for a single point as the expected value of the loss and here this would then simply be the L2 loss so we take the true function minus the estimated function to the power of 2 and compute the expected value to yield this loss. Interestingly this loss can be shown to be decomposable into two parts. So there is the bias and the bias is essentially the deviation of the expected value of our model from the true model. So this essentially measures how far we are off. The other part can be explained by the limited size of the data set. So we can always try to find a model that is very flexible and tries to reduce this bias and what we buy in, what we get as a result is an increase in variance. So the variance is the expected value of y hat minus the current value of y hat to the power of 2 and there of the expected value. So this is nothing else than the variance that we encounter in y hat. And then of course there is a small irreproducible error. Now we can integrate this over every data point in X and we get uh, the entire loss for the entire data set over our loss for the single point. By the way, a similar decomposition exists for classification using the 1,0 loss, which you can see in reference 9. It's slightly different, but it has similar implications. So we learn that with an increase in variance, we can essentially reduce the bias, the prediction error of our model on the training data set. Let's visualize this a bit. So on the top left, we see a low bias, low variance model. This is essentially always right and doesn't have a lot of noise in the predictions. The top right, we see a high bias model that is very consistent, so no variance, but it's consistently off. In the bottom left, we see a low bias, high variance model. So this has a considerable degree of variation, but on average, it's very close to where it's supposed to be. And on the bottom right, we have the case that we want to omit. This is a high bias, high variance model, 
which has a lot of noise and it's not even where it's supposed to be. So we can choose a type of model for a given data set, but simultaneously optimizing bias and variance is in general impossible. So bias and variance can be studied together as model capacity, which we'll look at on the next slide. So the capacity of a model describes the variety of functions it can approximate. And this is related to the number of parameters. So often people say, oh yeah, that's the number of parameters. Increase the number of parameters, then you can get rid of your bias. Yes, this is true, but it's by far not equal. To be exact, you need to compute the VC dimension. And uh, this is an exact measure of capacity. And it's based on counting how many points can be separated by a model. So the VC dimension of neural networks is extremely high compared to classical methods. And they have a very high uh, model capacity, and they even manage uh, to memorize uh, random labels. So if you look at reference 18, that's again the paper that it was in looking into learning ImageNet with random labels. The VC dimension, by the way, is ineffective in judging the real capacity of neural networks. Still, we can always reduce the bias by increasing the model capacity. So keep that in mind, but if you increase the model capacity, you may end up in the problem that you receive overfitting in the very end. So let's have a look at the role of data. And here we plot the loss against the number of training samples. And what you see is that the training loss increases with the number of training samples. And so it's more difficult to learn a large data set than a small one. If you have a very small data set, it may be very easy to memorize it entirely. Uh, machine learning is th the science of sloppiness. <laughs> but the problem with a small data set is it will not be very representative for the data that you're actually interested in. So the small data set model will cause a high test loss. Now by increasing the size of the data set, you increase the training loss as well but the test loss goes down. And this is what we're interested in. We want to build general models that really work on unseen data. So this is a very important property, and this is also the reason why we need so much data, and also why big companies are interested in getting so much data and storing it on their servers. Which means that we have 99% have of all the data. So technically, we can optimize the variance by using more training data. So we can create models of higher capacity, but then we also need more training data. But in the long run, this is likely to give us lo very low test losses. Instead of what humans might need, just dozens of examples, these things will need millions. Also, the model capacity has to match the size of the training data set. If you have a too high capacity, you will just create a really bad overfit and your model will not be very good on unseen data. Because it doesn't work. Now, the question is, of course, if we can't get more data. Yeah, let's say you're in a domain where you have limited data, then, of course, you are in trouble. Let's study these effects with a fixed data set size. So on a finite data set, you make the following observations. If you now increase the model capacity, your training loss will go down. Of course, this is with a higher capacity, you can essentially memorize more of the training data set which is like the, the brute force way of solving a learning problem, just memorizing everything. But the problem is you produce a bad overfit at some point. So in the beginning, increasing the model capacity will also reduce the test loss. But at some point, this is then when you go into the overfit, the test loss will increase. And if the test loss increases, you are essentially at the point where you're overfitting. So Later in this class, we will look into the idea of using a validation data set that we take out from the training data set in order to produce a surrogate of the test loss. So we will talk about this in a couple of videos. What we can see here is that we can trade an increase in bias for a reduction in variance. And for a specific problem, there might be favorable trade-offs here. Generally, the idea of regularization now is to reduce overfitting. And where does the idea come from? Well, we enforce essentially prior knowledge. 
One approach is data augmentation. You can adapt the architecture because you know something about the problem. You can adapt the training processes. You can do pre-processing and so on. So this is a lot of additional steps that can be taken in order to incorporate prior knowledge. The actual regularizers can also be used and they are then augmented into the loss functions and they typically constrain the solutions to equality constraints or inequality constraints. So we will also have a short look into these solutions. Machines don't really have common sense. Okay, so this already brings us to the end of this video. And next time we will look into the classical regularization methods used in neural networks and machine learning. And I'm looking forward to welcome you again in the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you.